Theme song, take one. And I'm Chris. Hi, Chris. In case you haven't joined us before and you don't know how this works out, she is the namesake of the podcast, and I'm her sidekick, I guess. You're very handy in a multitude of ways. I see your value. Yeah, I'm like a Swiss Army knife in that way, right? Yes, you are. You're the perfect Swiss Army knife. So how's everything going with you since we last talked on the podcast? The last one, I guess, was the war on sex workers. Yes, indeed. Uh, I've been actually really well. I've been writing a lot. I've been doing a lot of projects. I've been presenting and teaching a lot of classes. Excellent. Excellent to hear. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I have a kind of a funny story I was going to share with everybody from last night. Oh, pray tell. <laughs> so we were lying in bed last night and, and you seem to be in a little bit of a post-coital bliss. I was in a very good mood. And you had to pee. I did. And you were going to go into the bathroom because the bathroom in my house, the downstairs. Is a reasonable place to pee. Yeah, they, yeah, I would prefer you pee in the bathroom instead of in the bed, on the floor. Right. You can pee in my sink. That's fine with me. Pee outside in the yard all you want. But last night we were laying in bed and you needed to go to the bathroom. And the bathroom is right next to my bedroom downstairs. And right before you went into the bathroom... I told you a little story about how a few nights ago I woke up at three in the morning and I hear this strange sound coming from somewhere in the house, this <laughs> sound, and I have no idea what that is because I know- Why would I'm, you? Why would you? Your first instinct is you lie in bed and think, well, maybe it'll just go away. Right, right. That was the first instinct. It'll go away. It'll resolve. But it didn't. And no. I kept hearing it. <laughs> So I went out of my bedroom, I opened the door, and my cat comes running out of the bathroom right next to my bedroom. And so I think maybe the cat was in the bathroom doing something, but I hear this other scurrying in the bathroom right there. And I think, okay, there's probably another cat in there. Maybe another cat got in the house through the pet door, and they're having some confrontation in the bathroom. I turn on the light, and there's this massive raccoon sitting in my bathtub. Don't call me a raccoon! I'm sorry. I took it too far. I meant trash panda. How big? When big. you say massive, what massive. Do you mean? Well, it was the size of like a medium-sized dog. I would just say. <sighs> I, I would hold up my hands to demonstrate how big this raccoon was, but our listeners wouldn't really be able to hear it over but the audio. A medium-sized dog is both an accurate and terrifying description. It was larger, much, much larger than my small chihuahua. Well, well, I will tell you that. Yes, a couple chihuahuas duct taped together at least. Yeah, so it's three in the morning. I have this massive raccoon in my bathroom. So, of course, my instinct Trapped is, in your bathtub. Yeah, I, I yell at it, bang on the door to try and scare it, and it tries to climb up the shower curtain <sighs> and shreds the shower curtain <laughs> in the process of trying to climb up it oh, and shit. eventually runs out into the living room where the patio door is, but it can't figure out how to get through the pet door. Because it's fucking dumb. Back outside. And so I have to open the front door and oh. go around and chase it where it's hiding behind the couch now. So I have to go around and keep making noise and yelling at it. But it completely misses the front door, runs into the kitchen. So I have to chase the raccoon all over the house until it finally sees the open front door and scurries off into the night. And it's not until after that that I realize it's been oh. pissing all up and down the hallway as I've been chasing it around the house and there's that massive puddle of piss behind the couch because it was so scared as it lost control large of its person bladder. Changing, chasing it all throughout the house. Oh. And of course, that moment was the moment that my dying dog, who we have to put down tomorrow, unfortunately, decided that 
it would be a great time to come out and shit in the middle of the floor. So there I was, completely wide awake now, three in the morning, cleaning up these massive puddles of raccoon piss all over the house. And dog shit. And, and dog you got shit a shredded shower curtain. And I had really had a difficult time getting back to sleep after that. Yeah, I would imagine. But the funny thing was, is that we were lying in bed last night. You were you, very blissed out in a very good mood. And you share this story with me. Yeah, right before you have to go to the right. bathroom. Because it reminded me, you're like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. And, and you're I like, said, funny thing. Funny thing. There was a <laughs> raccoon in there the other night. The thing is, I don't live in a rural area. I live no, in a pretty standard n- suburban area. Non-raccoonish sort of vibe. Yeah, so it was complete shock. I'd have never seen. I've lived in this house for nine years. I'd never seen any evidence of raccoons. You don't often have raccoons in your bathtub. No. This is the first time I've ever found a raccoon in my bathtub. But your reaction to it was great. Because now you have to get out of bed in the dark. In the dark. And go to the bathroom. In the middle of the night. And you're terrified of raccoons. So what did you do? Well, I advanced with great determination and ninja-like moves in the bathroom, doing karate chops in the air. On guard. I'll let you try my Wu-Tang style. To make any raccoons. Karate chops in the air. The raccoon's going to be on the floor. Well, I'm tall. So I cleared, I attempted to clear out the bathroom and scare any potential raccoons. Yeah, I heard you. I was in bed and I hear you go into the bathroom and hear this loud, Hiyah! Yeah, I did. I was <laughs> trying to scare any, the, any creature ra- that might be well, the, wor- in the See, the worst part was that the shower curtain had gotten closed. So once I cleared the bathroom, I had to also clear the bathtub. And the nerve wracking of having to slide back the shower curtain to ascertain there's nothing in the tub. And then after all of this, what did you end up having in the backyard? Oh, there were raccoons in the backyard. It was hot, so we slept with the windows open. I hear this scuttle in the backyard, and I go out, and there's two large raccoons climbing up over my fence into my backyard, so I had to go chase them away. So I guess I have raccoons. You do. Do you think maybe they're coming to get your cherries? That's free food? All the cherries are gone. Maybe they were eating all the cherries. The cherries off the ground. Yeah, you lament the, the loss of all those cherries. Maybe less cherries means less raccoons. You're Possibly. in the middle of a pretty hardcore raccoon infestation, my But there friend. wasn't enough cherries on that tree to support many raccoons. Well, maybe they'll move on now. Hopefully so. I don't want to have any more raccoon encounters. <laughs> raccoons aside, we got a pretty good episode coming up for you guys today. We have a special guest that's going to be joining us later on, if you want to hype that a little bit. Oh, yes. Me and this guest go back a really long time. She is an educator an author, a former pro-dom. Her name is Princess Kali. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of her. The one, the only. She is the person that founded Kink Academy, and I have been shooting for Kink Academy for years now. I have a number of instructional videos up there. Her specialization is erotic humiliation, which is a, a fetish that I'm curious about and don't have a lot of experience about. She's written a book, Enough to Make You Blush, Exploring Erotic Humiliation. She is the creator and owner of Kink Academy, and she is an educator, speaker, and coach, and she's in the process of writing another book. So she's going to be joining us today. I'm really looking forward to doing an interview with her. She's a lot of fun. She's good people. But before that, a couple things that I wanted to talk about. Pray tell. Well, the first thing I wanted to say is that you have a new merch store open online. I do. As a matter of fact, I've had a lot of people that have contacted me over the years who wanted to know if I've had any merch. I've never put something together before because, you know me, technical stuff is not exactly my strong suit. Luckily, I have you. You are my Swiss Army knife. And there is now a merch store where you can get T-shirts, mugs, pins, cell phone cases, water aprons. bottles, aprons. <laughs> All sorts of stuff with your face. If you want to get an official Dirty Talk with Rain de Grey t-shirt. There's or logos, mug. initials, there's a face. If any of if you've always wanted to have a piece of me, now you can. Yeah. And we even have some of the artwork from our past episodes up in there. You can get an official Amateur porn group play dynamics with naked mole rats t-shirt. That would be a pretty cool t-shirt, I must admit. Or sex ed taught us to always wear protection before eating our bananas. Also a very good t-shirt. Check out the store. The link will be on the website. And what's that website? The website is com. Yes. The other thing Hmm. I was curious about was that 
I've noticed that my penis mm -hmm. curves up and to my right. I guess if you're looking at me, it would be your left. Right. Right. I don't know if you've noticed this curvature. I think that most men have a curvature. Well, most men do have a curvature, and most men you will curve to either the right or the left. Correct. Some men curve down. Right. I, I, I think more commonly it's the upward curve. Correct. Right. If you're looking at the inverted banana, is the upward curve, but slightly to my right. Mm -hmm. And so what I was curious about was that I have always masturbated with my left hand. Mm -hmm. I'm dominantly right-handed and I do everything else with my right hand except for masturbation. That was always my default hand that I went to. I know a lot of guys that are right-handed masturbate with their right hands as well. Right. So my curiosity is how much does the hand that you masturbate with affect which direction left or right your penis curves in? I have always wondered that myself. Yeah, and I can't find anything on that online. I guess people have There's haven't. a shocking lack of scientific research. People on... don't think that this is worth looking into? I think it is. And I've done some study, and I can't find anybody. I looked at the, the Kenzie Institute, and I, nobody has really thought about this. I mean, there's plenty of information about male penis <gasps> curvature and that it does curve I have an right. idea. What's that? We should do a study. If you would like to. I would like to do a study and recruit all of our listeners. Sure. Yeah. Anybody out there, any guys out there, let us know what hand you use to masturbate with and whether your penis curves to the right or to the left, I guess, depending on their perspective. Right. Because as I'm looking down at mine, it's to the, my right hand side. Right. So that's why I'm thinking my left handed jerking off has trained my dick so my the information right. that we would need is do you use your right hand or your left hand and is your curve to your right or your left yes so we can draw for science yes for we want to see if there's any correlation between which hand you use and where your, your penis is pointing if we get enough submissions and we get enough information, I will put together a quick chart or a graph or an article. Yeah. And we'll I, announce if all there's the not research the out there, we should do it. Yeah, definitely. So email us. You can email rain at raindegray.com. To be clear, we <laughs> just need you to write the information as to what hand and what direction it points. We don't want to be receiving a lot of dick pics. Well, particularly since I'm not going to be the one looking at it. I'll be the one receiving all the emails that you send. So uh, if you want to take a photo of your dick to show which way it lists, just know I'm never going to get it because I will, my I will get it. And you already get plenty of dick pics I get so many online dick pics. through all your social media accounts. I, I'm drowning in dick pics. And unfortunately, pics. these guys haven't let you know which hand they masturbate with. No, they're not telling me. Because we could look at me. those pics and infer... But we don't want your dick pics. So that's not what we're asking for here. We just want a little information. Which hand do you use? Which for science. Way to, which way does it point? Right. For science. Email us at the rain at raindegray.com email or phone us at, at 614-R-D-E-G-R-E-Y. That is 614-733-4739. We are also taking questions on that same phone line or via email as well. If you have any questions and want to be featured on an upcoming episode of this podcast, feel free, call in, leave a message with whatever question you have, and we might answer it on here as well. Should we move on to some... News tidbits. News bits. News Not tidbits. Tidbits. News bits. Okay. All right, news bits time. But they're bite-sized bits. That makes them tidbits. From around the world to your living room, this is... News tidbits. So, Miss Rain, yes. what news bit do you have for us today? <laughs> I have something that is near and dear to my heart and is a topic that I am passionate about. 
I am a bit of an amateur cultural anthropologist. I am fascinated by humans, relationships, sexuality, family, and how we make that work from culture to culture. For a long time, monogamy has been the de facto assumption for how most relationships in this world work. And in the beginning of human history, we didn't have monogamy. When we switched from being hunter-gatherers to farmers is when monogamy and raising animals and staying in one location and following the genealogy of seed became way more important. Monogamy, more than anything, was a business arrangement. It was the most effective way in this world to have a male and female together raising kids. Times are changing. I am very dedicated to the concept of polyamory and alternative relationship structures, and I am super happy to announce that my news tidbit <laughs> bit <laughs> is something that I actually find really exciting. A Canadian judge from uh, Newfoundland, Justice Robert Fowler, has ruled that all three parents, a woman and two men, are listed on the birth certificate as the parents of their child. They have not done DNA testing. They have not established which of the two men is the biological father of the child. The judge has ruled that since all three parents are invested in the relationship and raising the child in what appears to be a strong and supportive structure, that both of the father's names are going on the birth certificate. And I think that's amazing and touching, and that might be the first thing now, but if you think about it, Gay marriage was inconceivable a decade ago, and now it's become standard. And I do firmly believe that as poly relationships become more socially acceptable, and there's less of an emphasis on monogamy, that there will be more things like this. You know who's going to be happy? Lawyers. Oh, I'm sure, because- the Oh, the divorces, divorces and the custody squabbles and the property, everybody wins once you- You're allow. saying that the relationships aren't going to work out? That's I'm a saying that attitude. in I'm saying that in general relationships, whether they're poly or monogamous, can have a hard time working out. So I guess based on this, Canada allows multiple marriages. No, here's the thing: it's that's still illegal. It's they consider themselves married; they're not legally married because that would be a bigamy charge. Yeah. But what the ruling allowed was for both of the men's names to go on the birth certificate as the father of the child along with the mother's name. So the next step would be to legalize bigamy. That's an entirely different thing. And that is, a, that is a pretty huge step upwards. I think that the step right now is making polyamory a reasonably viewed relationship where there isn't so much social stigma. Uh, I'm out as poly. My neighbors know that I'm poly. I'm out as poly as well. Right. Just so everybody out there knows, you have a husband, I have a wife. Correct. But yet we still date each other. Correct. And you are a major caretaker for my daughter as well. Correct. You don't need to be married to have a family. Whether or not you add the bonds of matrimony, if you are in a poly situation with anyone and you either purchase a house, buy property, or are raising a child, lawyers are going to get involved with that if that relationship doesn't work out, whether or not it's monogamous or poly. That's true. It's, so really, it's more business. It is. And I've always been amazed at how easy it is to get married, but you need a doctorate degree to untangle that marriage. <laughs> any, any drunken fool can wander into a courthouse. They want you married. Or they a 24-hour chapel in right, Vegas and right. get that ring. They don't want you divorced. That doesn't work for society. Pro-marriage, let's make divorce as hard as possible. Yeah. So we got gay marriage now. Let's go for multiple polyamorous it, marriage. It, it makes sense from a business perspective. And when you hear about these cases where there's rigid, freaked out, religious fundamentalist cake bakers, you're cutting yourself off from oh, business. Oh, yeah. The person in Colorado that didn't yeah. want to make a cake for, for the gay marriage. Right. right. And it's just, you, once you legalize gay marriage... If florists and, and rentals and tuxedos and cake, that's just more profit. It's, it's more of a boon to the economy. Imagine making, once you have polyamorous relationships is socially acceptable, what that is, is a boon to the economy. So you're saying do it for the profit motive. I'm, I'm trying to find a workaround for rigid religious types. Oh, so get over, just, get over your racism or your sexism or your, your homophobia. homophobia 
or your judgment. Yes. Because there's money to be made. That's the universal language. And at the root of it, everyone is greedy. That's what I'm saying. Yes, I'm using human nature as a way to try and shoehorn in social change. Yeah. All right. So everybody, go out there, grab the dollars, and let go of all your prejudice. Exactly. (laughs) Hey, that's a convincing pitch. (laughs) It is. It's a very logical one. So that's all you got? Are you rolling your eyes at my logic? <laughs> no, no, you are. You're rolling like, your eyes over I there. Like I can see it. I like your logic on that. I'm super logical. I like yeah. it too. Yeah. Don't don't be bigoted because- It'll, it'll you affect make, your wallet. Because you're not making the, the big bucks you could be making exactly. if you weren't bigoted. Right. Excellent. That, yes. I like, no, I, I, I agree. I think, I think that's a valid argument. It's a very I valid think argument. that you shouldn't be bigoted- because you shouldn't be bigoted i know that but it's humans it's, it's humans it's incredibly stupid to be bigoted i know that and you know that however sometimes people need a little bit of sugar to help the medicine go down in this case the sugar is money yes a little bit of money makes the medicine go down Correct. even easier yes. than sugar because mm-hmm. think of all that sugar you could buy right exactly you're welcome yeah all right well thank you for sharing that you are very welcome. I'm glad that there is a progressive judge up in Canada Me that too. is willing to see this couple's side. More like thruple. Yes. I apologize. You're not very progressive, young man. <laughs> my, not well, a couple's side, the thruple's side. The thruple's side. Yes. Uh, yes. My, my language needs to catch up with these new and changing times. Mm-hmm. Before you know it, you're going to be in your bathrobe and slippers. Get off my lawn! I already... Fuck, I don't want anybody on my lawn. <laughs> I know. Fucking raccoons. <laughs> Dude, you're raccoon plague. Oh. Well, thank you for sharing, my dear. <laughs> what do you have? My news bit today is about bees. Bees? Say what now? Bees. Buzz, buzz, bees. bees. Yes. Bees that sting? Yeah, and that's what it's about, is stinging bees. Really? Pray tell. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there is bee acupuncture. Oh, yes. I have heard of this. Bee acupuncture. That's a thing. Granted, there's a lot of things out there in this wide world. But yes, I have heard of bee acupuncture. Yeah, there's a there's a whole therapy system that's built around using bee products, pollen and beeswax. Sure, royal jelly, royal beeswax, jelly, yes. pollen. Bits. And also bee venom. People use bee venom. And in the United States, its most common use is for people suffering from multiple sclerosis and arthritis. So there is, I guess, a medicinal use for the bee venom. But my story is about bee acupuncture. I was astounded to find out that there are people that go and pay good money to be stung by live bees as a therapeutic medicinal process. Yes, I have. I have heard of it. I have not experienced it myself but i have heard of bee acupuncture yeah it is definitely a thing i don't know why people would do this i try to avoid bee stings as much as possible and when I, I hate bees whenever i see them around i just even though it's, it's not that painful it's just the thought of getting stung by the bee is just not an appealing thing and i don't think i would ever go and pay money to have somebody intentionally sting me by bees here's the messed up thing is i don't actually I hate bees. I hate yellow jackets and wasps, things that can sting and then continue on with their merry way. Yeah. But here's the thing. When a bee stings you, that's one and done. Their entrails come out. Yeah. So this bee acupuncture has people that are paying money for bees to sting them, and then the bee dies as a result of that. It dies. So you're you're having to go through a lot of bees, and I know that the honeybee populations are dwindling around the world. Already dwindling. So if you were a vegan, you couldn't have bee acupuncture. No, you wouldn't be. That would be completely against your moral compass, Mm -hmm. right? I remember the last time I was stung by a bee, I was filling up my truck with gasoline, Oh. and I have an old beater truck that I drive, and I hadn't driven it in a matter of months but i had to take it somewhere so i stopped by the gas station to fill it up i popped open the little flap to access the gas cap and i reached in unbeknownst to me a wasp had made a nest in that little compartment where the gas cap is so i reach in to go take my gas cap off and fill my tank and i suddenly get 
bitten by this wasp and freaked me out. Understandably so. Yeah, I, my finger was sore for a couple it days. It was messed up for a while. Yeah, yeah, you remember that. And it was, yeah. and partly it was just the surprise of the whole situation. You don't expect to go fill you're your betrayed. gas tank. You go to put gas in the tank of your vehicle stung. and you're being stung by a wasp? Yeah. yeah. Who so expects that? I avoid interactions with bees as much as I can. So the thought to me of somebody going and intentionally getting stung is a completely foreign idea. I, I understand people are into pain and into sensation, and that's fine with me, but you're intentionally exposing yourself to what could be a potentially dangerous venom. Right. And that's what happened in this case. Hmm. Is a few months back, a 55-year-old woman from Madrid had been getting these therapies for a while, and suddenly she had a negative reaction during a scheduled be acupuncture session she started going having, into anaphylactic shock right? i don't know if it was necessarily anaphylactic shock she started having breathing issues they had to take her to the hospital over the next few days she started having multiple organ failures and eventually wound up dying so this is a risky endeavor that you can do by going and getting stung by live bees Yo, well, that's the thing about the, the human body is that you can spontaneously develop an allergy to something that you've been exposed to and were fine before. Yes. Yeah, and that's what they suspected happened to this lady. That's how some people develop latex allergies as well. Is right. That they're exposed a to a lot of latex. Some people develop peanut allergies right. from that as well. So if you continually expose yourself to something, the toxin can build up in your system and mm -hmm. something you were non-reactive to before suddenly can be extremely dangerous. Bee stings can be extremely dangerous to lots of people. Oh, yeah, definitely. This is the first recorded case of anybody dying from this. I'm sure that there probably have been other people that have had severe reactions to this practice, but this is the first recorded case of somebody dying from bee acupuncture exposure. So, so is your takeaway, don't pay people money to sting you with bees? Yeah, I guess so. But my takeaway is also trying to understand the psychology of these people that are into alternative medicine and would think that bee acupuncture is some sort of viable medical method. People have such a bewildering amount of beliefs and concepts. And some of the stuff that people swear by makes absolutely no sense to me. Oh, yeah, so much of the stuff. We could get into a whole conversation about right. the, the That's That is a whole podcast unto itself, my that's friend. That's out there. Oh, definitely. People, they hold so many strange ideas when it comes to healthy things for your body that can be potentially dangerous. I know you had talked about in one of your columns drinking of turpentine. Oh, yeah. There's a huge uh, subculture of people out there that believe that turpentine will clear parasites from your body. Yeah. And turpentine is an incredibly toxic poison that is so unhealthy for you. But there are people out there, a lot of Christians and right-wingers that believe that they're contaminated by the parasites and poisons of the world. There's actually a, a noticeable subculture of people that believe that homosexuality is caused by parasites. And that if you take turpentine to clear the parasites out of your body, you will be cured from homosexuality. Yes. So my takeaway from this is be very cautious engaging in any sort of alternative medicine. And also think before you go and knowingly expose yourself to a dangerous toxin. <laughs> you might want to think twice. If you've already scheduled your bee acupuncture appointment... <laughs> Think twice about it and make sure that they have an EpiPen ready for you, just in case. That's my news bit, because I came across that in the news a little while ago, and I thought it would be an interesting little bit to share with our listening audience. Thank you for sharing your bit on bees with all of our listeners. You're welcome. Coming right up. We are going to have an interview with your friend, Princess dun, 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 Drum roll. Princess Kali. See you in a bit. If you've been enjoying this podcast so far, this is the moment where I want to reach out to all of our listeners and remind you 
that this podcast is not possible without your support. If you enjoy what I'm doing, if you enjoy the podcast, if you enjoy the advice column, if you enjoy the articles, go ahead and head on over to raindegray.com. That has everything collected in one handy place. And look me up on Patreon, Rain to Gray on Patreon. I am so grateful for everyone that reaches out and likes what I'm doing and supports me. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is made possible by listeners like you. If you enjoy what we're creating, please consider supporting me on Patreon. It makes all the difference. Thank you so much. I'm also always taking questions for this podcast. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave me a message at 614-R-D-E-G-R-E-Y. That's also 614-733-4739. Go ahead and leave a question for the podcast or the advice column, and you just might be featured on an upcoming episode. I am really happy to announce our guest for today, which is someone that I have worked with for years. I am a huge fan of her. I love her style. She does coaching. She does teaching. She's a published author. I met her years ago in the industry, Princess Kali. And this is actually a true story. Back in the day, I used to go to Mr. S and I would see these DVDs. And there was this hot dominatrix with really long hair. And I was like, who is that woman? And she had all of these DVDs. And I never figured that years down the road, I would end up working with her and doing a lot of episodes of Kink Academy with her. And I've done some articles for her and have always gotten along with her and enjoyed her really well. And she is here today to talk about, I believe that you have one book and there's another book in the works. Hi, Rain. Yes, I'm so excited to be here to talk to you. I'm a huge fan of yours as well. And yes, my first book, Enough to Make You Blush, Exploring Erotic Humiliation, came out in 2015. And I'm working on my second book right now uh, called Authentic Kink, which will be out in the fall of 2018 around September. I am super happy to have you on this podcast, and I would wanted to talk to you. You are basically the person that I view as the expert on the humiliation kink. I have explored a lot of kinks in my day. I am like a Whitman sampler of kinks, but I will be perfectly honest, I have never really understood humiliation as a kink. And I figured there would be no better person to ask to describe to me what it is about humiliation that is a turn-on. I mean, you've written an entire book on the subject. Could you break it down, your thoughts on it, what it is as a fetish that makes you hot, and why you enjoy it so much? Oh, happy to, Rain. Yeah, I've been teaching my humiliation class for about 16 years and had the idea to do a book really at the start. 16 years ago, there wasn't a book on humiliation and I thought that there needed to be. And then my attention was diverted by founding kinkacademy.com and teaching and doing some other things. And so finally, when I circled back around to it a few years ago and decided to really finally complete this book, I was a little surprised that that in that time there had not been a book published. But then as I actually sat down to put my live class on the page, I realized why. And it's because it is a completely complicated fetish in the sense that it's not particularly linear and that the, the word or phrase erotic humiliation doesn't actually give anyone all that much information. And so one of the first things that I like to help people understand is that the idea of erotic humiliation actually covers a super wide range of activities because a single activity is not something that is guaranteed to humiliate someone. Humiliation is entirely rooted in personal context. And that's something that I get into very deeply in the book that that the number one rule when it comes to erotic humiliation play is that you can't humiliate someone with something they don't find humiliating. So the first thing to understand is that it's super personal. 
it's based entirely on your relationship to the various activities, that it happens in the mind rather than being something that is usually rooted in physical activities. Like the physical activities are just a manifestation of the mindset that we're trying to achieve. Interesting. Okay, that that does actually explain a lot to me at just first starting out because you are right in that humiliation is so person-specific. And what one person's going to find humiliating, another person is not necessarily going to. So I guess in a way, I'm not surprised that in the 16 years you were teaching your class that a book hadn't come out because I don't think there would be anyone that really would have the groundwork or the experience to tackle the topic like you did. And I find it fascinating that you have managed to carve out a corner at this point in my mind as a kinkster who's been at this for years. When I think of erotic humiliation, I immediately think of you. You've tied those two topics in my head. And I find that fascinating and intriguing. And it's, it's also, it's such a... I don't even want to say like nebulous, but because it is so mind-based as opposed to body-based, it has to be specifically tailored for each individual person you would be working with. So you really have to get into someone's mind in order to make the humiliation you're doing work for that person. What do you do to get into a specific person's mind to tailor a scene for humiliation that's effective for them? That's a great question, Rain. In my classes, I've been teaching the humiliation topic for a very long time, and it's often when people come to the class, they're seeking me out to give them a list of activities. Do this, and then this person will feel humiliated. But the problem is that it's so rooted in personal context that it's important to more understand the broad concepts of it and then get to know the individual person. For example, one of my favorite demonstrations of this is the idea of a cisgendered straight man in panties. That cisification is an activity that a lot of folks immediately associate with humiliation, right? Because what quote unquote real man would want to be dressed in women's clothing because that's an obvious demotion from their manhood, right? This idea of cisification being an automatic humiliation technique is the prime example of how when someone's personal context is different, they're not going to have the response that you want. Because one of my submissives, who is technically a cisgendered man, when you put him in panties, he prances around like, aren't I so pretty in panties? And he's, he's, it, it, it doesn't re- result in the mindset that someone wants. And so the first thing that you have to do is get to know what are the personal triggers that make someone feel smaller? Because first we really have to look at what is erotic humiliation. The definition that I have come to is arousal related to traditionally negative experiences. Now, one of the other confusing things about humiliation is that sometimes the arousal comes afterwards. It's not always something that happens within the scene. There is a a strong arousal or pleasurable response from being made less than your usual self. And so in order to have a successful humiliation scene with someone, you have to find out what does that. And in order to do that, we have to look at overarching social taboos. Because without things like sexism and classism and misogyny and body image expectations, those kinds of things, we wouldn't have erotic humiliation, right? There's a reason why more men request domestic chores as a humiliation experience than women to. And that's because of both sexism and classism issues where it's considered women's work. And so you have to really take a look at what someone's personal context is in relation to these social taboos. Okay, so the question that I have that I'm, I I mean, that was a really good answer. And I guess what I've never been able to grasp is what is erotic about being humiliated? Of course, I understand that people are responding that way. But for me, when I'm humiliated, it's not exciting for me. It's not arousing. 
But there's no denying that for a noticeable swath of humanity, there is a turn on for being humiliated. For people like me that would not understand that fetish, can you break down for people what is the turn on about being humiliated? What is it that is such a trigger that being put in panties and made to clean a house gets someone so hot? Well, I think that brings up an excellent point that even within the kink community, psychological torment is seen as fringe and edge play. And even within kinky folk, it really can be kind of a confusing extension of what otherwise makes sense, like bondage and impact play and those kinds of things. And to that, I usually say that it often related to power and the inverse of power. For me, my core kink, or what I call my kernel kink, is power and control. And so often the folks that are attracted to humiliation have some element of a desire to give up psychological control in the same way that folks who enjoy bondage or impact play might have a desire to give up physical control or control over what is happening to their body. So in that sense, it's no different than really any other kinky experience in the sense that it's about conscientious power exchange as well as a creative approach to exploring their sexuality. And I also like to make a couple of clarification points, right? Because someone who is into erotic humiliation is probably not into being humiliated in an everyday experience. Getting yelled at by your boss in front of your peers is not necessarily going to give somebody arousal in the same way that it would within a negotiated consenting scenes in the same way that somebody who's a masochist doesn't necessarily want to get kicked in the shin by somebody on the bus. Context and boundaries and consent matter in changing what would otherwise be a negative experience into something positive. And I believe that that's true for all kinky things. When a vanilla person looks at someone who is hogtied and getting smacked on the ass, they're completely baffled in using the exact same tone that, that you just used. And so really, it's not all that much different than the sort of taboos that we generally like to confront in the kink world. This is why I invited you on this show. Because that was the most perfect explanation that I could possibly, it all makes sense to me now. And I'm, I, like, I just really had an aha. <laughs> I did. I just I had an aha moment. Like, I get it now. So you're right, because I like the way that you describe power and control as your kernel kink. For me, as someone who's a masochist, where I'm giving over control of my body or I'm taking control of someone else's body, but I'm not doing the psychological play. For me, it's very physically based. There's a lot of resistance play. You are correct, indeed, that even in the kink community where it's, oh, impact, I get it. Bondage, I get it. Even in the kink community, people are like, what's this psychological stuff? That's some, that's some heavy friend shit you're playing with over there with that psychological play. And I didn't actually get it. When you do the, the heavier psychological stuff, the humiliation stuff, even kinksters that would be like the vanilla people that are looking at someone on a hog tie and being like, that's some weird shit. And then the, the average kinkster that's like, oh, sure, hog tie, what's the big E? And then you're looking at someone that's going further down that road where you're doing psychological play. That's fascinating for me. And I, I can't agree with you more in terms of someone who really does enjoy sensation play. Context is everything. In a consensual setup, I can experience some pretty heavy stuff, but if anyone were to do a 16th to that uh, to me in a vanilla setting, it would be incredibly violating and triggering and we would have an issue. It all starts to make sense to me. The question I have for you now is, at what point in your life, in your kinky journey, did you realize how much of a humiliation, you said that your kernel kink is control and power, at what point did you start to realize how important and how much of a turn on humiliation play was for you? So that's another good question, Rain. Although I want to mention one last thing about your last question, because one of the common assumptions that people make about 
what erotic humiliation is, is that it's always this really high level, or in this case, low level degradation scenes, somebody getting really deeply torn down. And in my 16 years of teaching this class, and then throughout the course of both publishing the book, and then since I've published the book, the thing that has become one of the most common themes is people saying, once they've read the book or taken my class, oh my God, I didn't even realize that I was into that. Because what they're doing is more on the teasing and embarrassment side. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to put your face in the toilet, give you a fleshy. It tends to be for more people about stuff like, oh, look at how turned on you are, you dirty slut. And look at what a good little bitch you are for me. This sort of inversion of both looking down on someone for doing an action and also celebrating them at the same time. And so just to kind of complete that thought about why people are into it, one of the things that I feel the most passionate about sharing with people is to remember that you can enter this sort of play with a light touch. And then, in fact, that's the way that I recommend to most people. Now that I've doubly answered your other question, back to the, to the question you just asked, which is at what point did I realize kind of how important it is and how powerful it is? And to be honest, I think that it's something that has been part of me at least since high school. I definitely was a teasing girl. I was in theater and I learned early how sharing my disappointment in others motivated them. The sort of like, well, you know, I thought that you could handle that task and maybe I just should have given it to someone else. And not about being mean, but really just about not avoiding other people's embarrassment. So I learned early that that was a good motivator. And in fact, that certain folks sought me out to work with me, I think unconsciously because of that. Now that wasn't within a sexual context in any way, but then As I got older and I was a stripper for a couple of years, I did bachelor parties. I never worked in a club and I developed a more continued unconscious attraction towards it that when men were disrespectful to me at my shows, I would stop stripping and I would put a robe on and I would say, if you boys are going to act like dogs, then you're going to bark like dogs. And that's the only way that I'll continue or I'm going to leave. <laughs> and universally, they responded and they barked like dogs. And if a man was being rude and the rest of his friends were being nice, I would put him in the corner and I would say, when you're ready to act like a mature voyeur, then I will allow you to continue. And how how much money I made from those kind of actions. I really hadn't been exposed to the definitive kink world up until I moved to the East Coast from California and went to a foot fetish party. And that's really when the whole universe just broke open for me in the most magnificent way. And I immediately started incorporating that into my style because I'm just kind of naturally, affectionately derogatory. <laughs> Interesting. You do have a affectionately derogatory is is definitely a trademark of your style. It's no doubt that you're a dom, but there's uh, in a way you have a a warm nurturing like you're you're very in control. But I prefer your style of doming this really regal, haughty, ice princess, super bitchy I don't like dominance where it comes from an anger or a disregard to your bottom. As far as I'm concerned, you're both opposite sides of the same coin. And I think that one of the mistakes that people make when it comes to dominance is to think the way to convincingly be dominant is to be an asshole. No, that just makes you an <laughs> asshole. You know, it doesn't make you a dominant. The way that you have dominance, it's so natural and in control, but you're not doing this, well, I'm going to be a cunt. And that makes me a super dommy pants because it's not. It just, it makes you harsh and abrasive. I definitely like the empathetic way in which you dom. The next question I have for you, I'm actually really curious about the next book that you're working on, Authentic Kink. I know the book's not come out, but can you do a bit of a teaser for our listeners and describe what your next project is going to be? Absolutely. I'd love to. I am so excited about this book. This book is 
the core concepts that I have been teaching for 16 years. Because one of the things that I've experienced over the last couple of years since I launched my humiliation book is people who come to my other classes. I teach domination and chastity and service training and face slapping and some other things. And they would come to my class and they would say, I love your philosophy, but I can't buy your book because I'm not into humiliation. And I realized that I have these core concepts. There's about a dozen core concepts that apply to BSM, to kink, to creative sexual exploration, regardless of what your interest is. And so this book is about taking those core concepts For example, one of the core concepts I talk about is ramping up, not diving in. They're usually encompassed by a nice little soundbite, something that's easy to remember and to visualize, and that really can give guidance to someone whether they are just starting to explore kink or whether they are someone like me who has been exploring kink in a variety of ways for a long time but is ready for a new way to look at things or even simply just reframing of things that they already do and believe. So authentic kink is really about taking these, I don't want to say universal truths because that just sounds white and entitled and, and, you know, but they really are these common threads. I would say common threads is a better, so yeah, I'm working on my branding even as we speak. (laughs) These common threads that folks can apply to their journey, no matter where they are on their journey and no matter what their particular interest is. And so that's the reason that I am extra excited about this book is it's going to take the things that I started talking about in humiliation and it's going to broaden it out to be accessible for hopefully a really wide swath of folks. Interesting. I do like the way that you caught yourself there. One of the mistakes I do notice that happens a lot is that people have the tendency to think that because it's something that's true to them, it must be applicable to every other kinkster. It's the one trueism. And I, as an educator, have had to learn that myself because this makes sense to me and it's a core concept, it's a core principle. I I tend to think it's going to apply to everyone else. And I learned the hard way just because it's something that makes sense to me. I can't say that it's going to apply to everyone else. Twoisms, T-W-U-E-isms, are something that I actually address in the book because I think that stereotypes and myths around kink are one of our biggest obstacles within the community, the Kool-Aid that we ourselves drink about what it is that we're doing. And so I've talked about the Twoisms for a long time. A lot of people in the community have talked about them. For me, it's, it is really important to share the complexity of kink. For example, in my humiliation book, I actually quote 60 other kinksters from a survey that I did in order to really demonstrate the wide experience of what humiliation can be. Because I'm a cisgendered, white, femme, dominant woman, and so that's a very specific perspective. It is really important for us as kinksters to remember how personal this is, even when it looks like there might be universal experiences or universal truths, right? That there's a way to create a framework of knowledge without it being an absolutist sort of approach. I'm excited. I've got a bunch of twoisms from other folks that I'll be sharing in the book, as well as some myth-busting around that stuff myself. If you want to do any myth-busting with me, I would be honored. (laughs) I wanted to touch on Kink Academy a bit. Is that something that you're still working on and adding videos to, or are you more focused on your books and education now? Oh, yeah. Kink Academy is heading into its 11th year, and we actually do have some new videos in the works that I'll be excited to share over the next few months. We've started shooting again now after focusing on the 2,000 videos for the last couple of years that we had already shot. When I first launched Kink Academy, and I launched it as a solopreneur, it was something that as a kink educator, I really felt was needed in the world because I went to all these different conferences. I knew incredibly brilliant kinky folk like you who were out there teaching classes, 
But there were so many people 11 years ago when I got this started that had no access to these kinds of classes and this kind of information in a very visual way. There's, of course, been books, but those are finite. And at the time, 11 years ago, it's, it's remarkable how the technology has changed and grown in that time because there weren't a lot of people producing videos. Sex education on YouTube wasn't as big. And so Kink Academy really filled a very important void that has since become delightfully overflowing with an incredible array of folks. And so now that we're starting to get some Kink Academy videos, some new content going again, I'm really excited to work with a whole new set of educators who are now able to access the kind of technology in order to really be a part of something like Kink Academy regardless of where they might be. So I'm actually really excited about the future of Kink Academy. And you are, hands down, one of our most prolific Kink Academy educators and one of my personal favorites because you really share things in a down-to-earth, approachable, understandable way. And that was the root philosophy of Kink Academy. It's not edu-porn. It is education about something sexy. Because I wanted people to be able to watch Kink Academy videos and really understand the logistics, both psychological and physical logistics that go into doing what we do in order to then go home and create these incredibly fantastical scenes and experiences for themselves. So Kink Academy has a bright future and you will absolutely continue to be a part of that, my dear. Oh, I'm blushing. <laughs> I, I think that down to earth and approachable has always been a trademark of how I approach anything that I'm doing. For me, I wanted authentic kink. That was what got me off is real people doing real things. And when you look at porn and you see these carefully constructed stuff, I get that fantasy is fun, but fantasy isn't real. We don't live in fantasy. We live in the real world. And whenever I did any educating or any exploring, it was so critical for me for it to be real and authentic. And that's a core of what I teach in my classes is when people compare themselves to stuff they see on screen. And they're like, I can't go home and do that because I don't look like those people on screen. What you're seeing carefully edited, polished, shot through a filter, all the awkward parts are out. And then when you go home, you can't create that on your own space and you get discouraged. And when I started doing educating, I want people to be able to learn sexy stuff that they can apply in their own lives without having to compare and contrast it to a screen. And I didn't want kinks to be this super unapproachable, only the top experts can do it and the rest of the people don't feel like there's a space for them. That's not how I do my kink. And I think that was one of the things that I really enjoyed doing Kink Academy videos is that I could share something I was passionate about with people without a pretense, because a pretense is not my bag. Right, exactly. And that's why I am intensely proud of the diversity on Kink Academy of ages and body shapes and gender presentations and approaches to kink and that we shot in both professional dungeons and homes because most people are not doing their kinky scenes in a perfectly appointed dungeon. And to me, that that has been a really important step in helping kink become something that goes beyond the story of, oh, type of a fantasy, which is which is fantastic. And we need entertainment and we need porn. I'm a huge fan of porn. But porn is porn and and education and how to can and should be separate from that, in my opinion. It's not that we can't learn from porn, but there are different things to learn from fantasy and entertainment than there are from really breaking things down. And that's what I think Kink Academy really serves our audience well in doing. A hundred percent agreed. And that, for me, was always one of the most appealing aspects of what you did with Kink Academy is that it was so diverse and wide ranging. I don't want people to go and look at this stuff and all they see is skinny, pretty white people. Because even though that's the common trope that's pitched at people, we're not all skinny, pretty white people. And there needs to be something where everyone can feel welcome. So I really feel that you were doing the Lord's work when it came to Kink Academy. And I know that there are many people out there <laughs> that are really grateful for everything that you've done. 
Well, thank you so much. I actually really enjoyed this. This was as educational as I had hoped. I knew you were the person to ask for this. I definitely have a new mindset and an explanation as to what it is with erotic humiliation. It now makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything that you would like to promote or pitch to let our viewers know where you can be found? I know that you do coaching. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me on today, Ray. And I always enjoy our conversations. This time, rather than just sitting and chatting after a shoot, we get to share we get to share with everybody. So, so thank you very much, and thank you to your audience, too. If you're interested in finding out more about me, you can look at coachingbycali.com. That's K-A-L-I, so coachingbycali.com, as well as enoughtomakeyoublush.com. And I do offer private coaching for singles and couples, and my authentic kink book, which will be available on Amazon as well as my personal website, should be coming out in the fall of 2018, so please take a look um, and keep your eye out for that. You can join my mailing list on the website to get any announcements. You can also follow me on Twitter at theprincesscally.com, and that's actually my handle across all social media, so you can find me on Instagram and FetLife too. And I just always really enjoy hearing from folks who have either read my books or taken my classes because it really helps me to continue to improve the information that I'm sharing with everybody. If you've got feedback, please feel free to drop me a line. And thanks again, Rain, and to everyone on your team. It was lovely having you on, my dear. I hope that you have a lovely day. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks so much, Rain. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. That's all we have for you guys today. I want to give a big thank you to Princess Kali, author, educator, instructor, and all-around cool person, as far as I'm concerned. I actually really learned a lot today. I was a topic I was pretty curious about, and I figured she'd be able to explain it, and she did. Definitely had some aha moments. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It was a great interview, and I feel like I learned a lot. Topics that I had never considered and ideas that broadened my mind. So thank you again, Kali, for joining us, and we look forward to having other great guests in the future. We actually have some really exciting guests lined up. We do. I'm not going to say yet. You're going to have to hang out and see. You'll have to come back and listen some more. Right, right. But there's some there's some good ones coming and up. And while you're listening, just a reminder that the podcast can now be found anywhere. We are on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. If you like the podcast, go... Follow us on one of those platforms, rate the podcast. It means a lot. It'll encourage other people to listen to this podcast. So share it with your friends, rate it, and grow the listener base. If you find it's valuable, share it. Help us get the word out. Yeah. So thanks for joining us again, and we will see you next time. Bye.